You're right. There are a lot of high notes on that. <laughs> oh, majesty. Listen, I want you to I hope you've got your Bible still open uh, to Acts chapter 28. I don't know if you have caught on to this, but Acts chapter 28 is the last chapter in the book of Acts, right? That means we have arrived. We are at the place that you and I have been working towards, believe it or not, almost a year. Uh, we started in Luke in our preparation for Christmas last year. So last week in November, first week of December, something like that, we started with the Gospel of Luke. And we continued in this story recorded for Theophilus all throughout the course of this year. And finally today we come to Acts chapter 28 in the very end, beginning in that verse 16 that Joey read for us of when we got to Rome. Paul's there. He's finally gotten there, and he understands this journey to Rome, right, as, as being God's divine calling. Matter of fact, God reveals that to him, you know, in the midst of the, the storm and the shipwreck that was about to come, and as a way of God comforting him to say, you're going to be okay, you're going to live through this, because I want you to get before seizure. I want you to be in Rome and proclaim the name of Jesus in that place. And finally, we're there. Now, Paul shows up, and if you remember from the reading that he, he, he shows up and he follows his typical pattern, which is amazing because it's been several years now. And how many times has he been spit at and thrown things at and been stoned and been beaten and been yelled at when he tries to go to his Jewish brothers to tell them about Jesus as the Messiah that they've been waiting for all this time? you think he would give given up, but Paul doesn't give up, does he? He's a statement of Christian perseverance. And when he gets to Rome, the first thing he does is he sends to the leaders of the Jewish churches. And you get the sense, like, that there, there were probably multiple synagogues in Rome, and they, they didn't seem to be all that connected. That seems to be the historical concept of what the Jewish uh, synagogues would have looked like in Rome. But he calls for the leaders of each of those groups, and they come and they meet him, and they talk to him at the house that he is under house arrest in. And he wants to meet with them again. They're like, yeah, we'd love to hear from you. So they schedule this time to come and for him to talk to them and essentially to have a chance to proclaim the kingdom of God and Jesus as the Messiah to these Jewish leaders. So he follows this typical pattern and he meets with these Jewish leaders. And I want you to look at what it is that, that he says. All right, Look with me in verse 21. They replied, so he's talking, I'm sorry, verse 23. Um, verse 23, they, this is the Jewish leaders, arranged to meet Paul on a certain day. So this is the second meeting where they will actually have in-depth conversation. And they came in even larger numbers to the place where he was staying. He witnessed to them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God and from the law of Moses and from the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus. Do you hear what Paul has done? And think about everything that's happened to Paul, everything that he has been through in order to get here. And even here, although he's comfortable, he's in a good spot physically, he's under arrest he, he, he has lost a sense of freedom. He's stuck in this house. They have to come to him. He can't go to the synagogue to teach with them and to worship with them. He, he, he's, he's been through it. But what does he do? From morning to evening, it says he witnessed to them. He speaks to them about who Christ is, what the kingdom of God is, what God has done. And notice, and this has been a continual pattern that we've seen all through Acts, and you've heard me say it over and over again. Notice the way that he says it. He says, he witnessed them from morning till evening, explaining about the kingdom of God, and from the law of Moses and from the prophets, he tried to persuade them about Jesus. The idea that who Jesus is, this thing that you and I believe, this person that we have placed all of our hope and our faith in, is not something new. This isn't something that Paul created or that Peter and John created or that anybody just said, yeah, let's make this up and follow that. The sense of historicity that is established in what Paul has consistently done about showing Jesus the Messiah as the continuation of not just the prophets, but even all the way back to the law and to Moses, to the very beginnings of our people, I think is significant. It's incredibly significant that our faith, our hope in Jesus is so grounded in history. And Paul uses that to connect with his people of history. Say, look, this is what you have always been believing in. 
This, this Jesus is the, the person you've been waiting for, is the Messiah you've been looking for. Matter of fact, if you go back to verse 20, he talks about this hope. For this reason, I've been asked to see you and talk to you. It's because of the hope of Israel that I am bound with this chain. So if you see what Paul does here, and the way Luke writes it, kind of a, a cycl- cyclical way, you've got the hope of Israel is what we hear from Moses and the law and what we hear from the prophets, all that point to Jesus, who is the hope of Israel. Paul establishes, he grounds this faith that you and I have that obviously he has as he proclaims it and witnesses it to the Jewish leaders here. He grounds it in in history. And I don't think the historicity of our faith can really be overemphasized. So that's what he does. He, he witnesses to these Jewish brothers and sisters. He explains to them about who Jesus is and how he's the fulfillment of all the law. But then he says in verse 28, when he recognizes, especially when they're getting up and leaving, right? Like these are his parting shots as half of them are leaving because they didn't like what he said. Verse 28, therefore I want you to know that God's salvation has been sent to the Gentiles and they will listen. Paul shows up in Rome and he follows the same pattern that we've been watching him do for years. He comes to the Jewish brothers. He explains to them. They don't want to hear it. He says, okay, we've tried. And now we'll share it with the Gentiles too. And look at the summary that that Luke writes in verse 30 and 31. For two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house, which is fascinating because there's two more years of story here, right? Like, Luke knows it. He's there with it. Have y'all ever seen the movie Paul the Apostle? It came out in uh, 2018. It's actually an excellent film, and that's coming from a guy that doesn't really like Christian-y films. I find them typically to be cheesy. This one is not. It's awesome. And I keep trying to think of a way for us to, like, watch it together, and I hadn't figured out the logistics of that yet because I want to eat popcorn, and we don't need to do that in here, right? So go rent it. It's on Amazon. It's, you can rent it for, like, $3 on almost every streaming service right now. It's worth watching, and it helps fill in this two-year gap in an imaginary way. But for two whole years, Paul stayed there in his own rented house, and he welcomed all who came to see him. And check this. He proclaimed the kingdom of God, and he taught about the Lord Jesus Christ with all boldness and without hindrance. Unhindered, some of your translations say. Paul, it's just fascinating to me. It's fascinating to me that Luke writes it this way, that he obviously thought of it this way, which meant that Paul thought of it this way, that he is under arrest. He's been, if not physically, at least emotionally in chains now for years, and yet he considers what he is doing here in Rome in the proclamation of the gospel as unhindered. He's bold about it. Nothing is holding him back. Like this man is under house arrest for this proclamation and yet calls it unhindered. And I have to think like that's the work of the Holy Spirit, right? Like that's not Paul being overly optimistic. This isn't like I can get through this and, and you know, girding ourselves up for hard times. This is the work of the Holy Spirit who tells us that human obstacles are ultimately insignificant. They may hurt us. And truth is they may slow us down. We don't want to overlook the realities of that. But can a human obstacle stop the forward momentum of the kingdom of God? No, it cannot. And that is the continual story from Luke, the gospel, I mean, the gospel of Luke, the Acts of the Apostles, and us, is that the forward momentum of the kingdom of God will go forward unhindered. And I'm fascinated by this, and I would actually love to come back and spend even more time on it, just imagining. This is like a sit-down-with-coffee kind of conversation of how Luke chooses to finish this story. Because like I said, there's two more years of stories here. There's a lot more to tell. I mean, obviously, we don't get any story about how Paul died. We have history and, and thoughts about that. There's even this idea that he may have gotten out of Rome and gone to Syria for a little while. We don't know. Luke doesn't tell us any of that. So how and why does he choose to finish this long story to the Theophilus in this way. He ends the story with Paul in Rome proclaiming the kingdom of God with boldness and without hindrance. Why does he say it that way? Does it seem unfinished to you? Does that feel like an open ended story as if there's still something to happen, like he was preparing for a sequel? You know, like that's how you would tell a good movie, right? If you don't want to do a sequel, you leave it open ended at the end of the, the movie. That, that's what Luke has done. And if you're remembering your history now, that's what Luke has done twice. He finishes the gospel and it's open-ended. There's no conclusion. 
he finishes Acts and it's open and there's no conclusion. Which takes us to the bigger picture. And this is the bigger picture that we've, I've been reminding you about now for almost a year, every now and then. That this, the, the, the Gospel of Luke and the Acts of the Apostles, you put them together and truth is it's our story, isn't it? It's the story of God and the story of His people. It's the story of, of us, of our people. And it starts, like think about the, the whole scope of this story that Luke has now told us. It started with two believers, didn't it? With Mary and Joseph. They believed enough in whatever it was that the angel told them and the idea that this Messiah will be coming. They believed enough. They said, okay, we're, we're with this and we will go through the heart. It started with two people. If you were to go back into Acts chapter 21 and verse 20, it says that there were thousands and thousands, some translations say tens of thousands of believers in Jerusalem alone. The story has exploded. It has grown from two to tens of thousands. It is the proclamation of salvation. And it's the good news, especially for you and me as pagan, terrible Gentiles, right? It's the good news that we get to be included. We've been invited to the story. Included into a story that we don't rightfully have a place to, to be in. It's a story of salvation, of inclusion, and of encouragement. Like, you have to remember, like, that this was actually written, you know, Luke, did he have an idea that maybe he was writing something of eternal significance? Maybe, because he wasn't an idiot. But he was writing it to Theophilus. This is a story written to his friend Theophilus and to his church, this church that's going to be struggling, this church that is being persecuted, this church that has probably become disheartened because they're looking at what's happening to them. They're looking at their friends who are being arrested and martyred, and they're like, what is happening, and where is this Jesus that we have placed all our hope in? So Luke writes the story and says, look at what God is doing. Look at the momentum of God. Look at how it moved from two to hundred tens of thousands. Look at the work of the Lord and be encouraged. That this story was originally written down to, to speak power and hope to a church that looks around and can't help but see problems around it. Can't help but see defeats in its own history. This story speaks, <laughs> speaks to us. It speaks to a church who's looking for encouragement, who's looking for hope, who has unbelievable faith despite what may be happening around us in the moment that God's not finished. And Luke writes this story to Theophilus. And God in his divine wisdom saves it and gives it to us. This is the story of us. The story of our church, the story of the church to which we get to belong, the story that brings hope and encouragement and power. And of course, that begs then the question where does that come from? Like, where does this power and hope come from? And the answer to that is the same answer to this is what is the central, most epic part of this large story? It's the death and resurrection of Jesus. The death and the resurrection of Jesus is the, the ultimate central part of this entire story that Luke, that Luke has written. And it is the sole source of hope and encouragement and power for those of us who are living it and who are following. You think about the way the death and resurrection of Jesus plays out in the story. If you look at the Gospel of Luke, the, what I would call part one, it's the pinnacle, right? Like everything builds to that. You start with this baby that's going to be born and two little people that believe in it and it leads to Jesus who has died and all hope is lost and then Jesus comes back to life and all hope is regained and given to us. It's the pinnacle of part one. Then you get into part two, what we know as Acts, and it's, it's the inspiration. It's the start of it. Luke reminds, hey, remember this thing happened? Now let me tell you what all happens because Jesus died and came back to life. So part one, it's the pinnacle. Part two, it's the inspiration. But Luke leaves the story open-ended. It's not finished because then it moves into part three. You and I live in part three, and it's, it's the hope. It's the hope that something is still happening. It's the hope that God is still working. It's the hope that God is not finished with us and that all these things, this story is not just something we can grab onto, but something that we are looking forward to that will be reenacted over and over and over again until Christ comes back and finishes it. It's hope for us. It's power for us.
to live, to witness, to proclaim the kingdom of God, especially for people like Theophilus who are being hurt, discouraged, disheartened. The realities of life sink in and they need, we need stories like Luke has given us this story of hope that comes from the resurrection of Jesus that God is still in control. It may not look like it in the moment, but he is. Now look at the table in front of us. These cute little plastic covered cups. <laughs> they really don't look that good in the, in the trays, do they? <laughs> Tell me what that means to you. Those little plastic covered cups that we're going to pass out in just a moment are a reminder, right, of the death and the resurrection of Jesus. That's what it's for. It's what it says right on the front of the table. In remembrance of me, of who Jesus is, and of what he has done as the pinnacle of part one, as the inspiration of part two, and as the hope for those of us still living out in part three. It all flows back to remembering Jesus and what he has done and what he is doing and what that power of his resurrection brings to us. So it's a remembrance of him and it's a reminder of hope that there were days in the past where it seemed dark and Jesus was dead, but that that's not the way it stays. God brings resurrection. He's a God of resurrection. So it's a reminder of hope for us. And it's a source of power. And a source of inspiration. For us to continue to proclaim the kingdom of God with power, as Paul does, with boldness and without hindrance. This thing that lays in front of us is a reminder of what God has done and an inspiration, a reminder of what God is still going to do. So what we're going to do is like, we're, Charles kind of told you everything's going to be weird today because we're trying a whole new idea about what church, church meetings can look like. And we're going to transition to the Lord's table, to communion. And I want to invite you to do two things. Like we're going to, well, I'm going to say come to the table. The deacons are going to come and we're going to pass it out because we're Baptist, right? That's how we do it. Um, but you're invited to, to come to the table to commune with Jesus and to commune with brothers and sisters. And I want to invite you to do two things in that process. First, come to this table in remembrance. It starts there because that's what Jesus told us to do, to remember him and what he did and what he continues to do because he's alive. Because his resurrection was real means that we have hope and expectation that our resurrection is going to be real. And in the intermediate time, he is alive and working in your life and in my life and the life of this church. So come to the table in remembrance of him, but also come to this table in anticipation. Come to the table of communion in anticipation. Because our story is not over. God has written this story with an open-ended ending because he's not finished.